How is it going? Welcome to Borderless Engineer, where we talk about web development and software architecture. In today's subject, we're going to discuss error handling. Now, error handling is something we all have to deal with. Everybody has errors. This is inevitable. The question is, what do you do with them? So today's content is going to be split into two parts. The first part is about why do you need central error handling? How do you achieve that? How do you distinguish between types of errors? What do you need to do when actually receiving an error? What are the next steps? And the second, the second part is really just taking all that, all those concepts and showing an actual example of how that works in Node.js. Now, if you're not a Node.js developer, don't shy away from this. You can still take the same concepts and probably apply them to your language. So the first question I think we should try to answer is why do we even need a central error handling mechanism? Why do we need it to be central? Why can't we just have it wherever the error happens? And the reason is quite simple. The reason is because there are many places where you can simply forget to catch the error and the error will be just thrown out there. And if you don't have anything to catch that error, then you can't do anything about it. And this point really leads us to the goal of error handling in general. When we're thinking about the goal of error handling and what do we need to do to achieve a solid error handling infrastructure, there are two sides to this. The first side is what do you do with the error? So there is an error. You don't want it to just sit out there and wait for the developer to maybe notice there is an error, especially if you're working with distributed systems where you can have tens of thousands of machines and you don't really know what's going on in any particular machine. So you need to have a higher level of observability of what happens in your system. And in order to do that, you need to take these errors and send them to a log provider. And then what you can do is you can actually set up alerts for them as well. So next time an error happens, you will be immediately alerted in Slack or on PagerDuty or on your email or whatever, and then you can go ahead and fix that error immediately. So that is the first side to it. The second side to this is the application side. And the application side means what does the application do when an error happens? And in order to understand that, we have to make a distinction between different type of errors because you don't always want to do the same thing when an error happens. So a useful distinction that's also very prevalent out there is the distinction between programmer errors and operational errors. Let's first talk about programmer errors. So what are they? Programmer errors are essentially bugs. So any bug that you have in a system, then it essentially can be classified into a programmer error. So these are one type of errors. Now, operational errors are the exact opposite in the way of intent. So programmer errors are not intentful. We never intended for an error to happen and it happened, but operational errors are intentful. We wanted an error to be raised for very different reasons. So it can be something like API validation where the user sent the wrong input for the API, or it can be something like reaching a certain limit. So these are the second type of errors, operational errors. And the way we handle these errors is very different. First, let's talk about how to deal with programmer errors. And this really depends on whether you have a stateful service or a stateless service. And the reason I make this distinction is because if you have a stateful service and an error happens and you capture that error, and now you have to decide what to do with the application, then if you don't restart it, then the application is gonna be in some sort of an intermediate state with the user state mixed in because maybe it's not been cleaned up, it's stopped in the middle, we can't really know. And there are many things that can just go wrong. That's why if you have a stateful service or even if you're using some state and you don't wanna take risks, then you're probably better off by just doing a graceful restart. Dealing with operational errors is much easier because you don't have the risks of having your application in an inconsistent state or in, an, in a corrupted state. So what you wanna do is just take the error and then you can send it to a logs platform or maybe you can gather metrics on it and you can do a lot of different things with it once it's centralized. And since it's logs we're talking about, it's only appropriate to mention CoreLogix, which are the sponsors of this, and also is the company I work for. So if you're looking for an observability platform, 
make sure you check it out. So after talking about the principles of error handling, now we can jump into the code and take a look at an actual example of how this works. Before we start with the code example, I wanna give a quick shout out to Jay Huang. Actually, uh, this is where I first learned about this. He has an article in TopTile called How to Build a Node.js Error Handling System. So I highly recommend it, it's a great article. And thank you, Jay, for the inspiration to actually learn this and make this. For showing the example, I'm gonna use the node type strip starter package. It's a package on GitHub that I published. It has Node.js and TypeScript, but it also has a bunch of different things, but really we're gonna use it because it has error handling infrastructure and it also has some examples about this error handling. So let's take a look at what's going on here. The first thing you wanna do when creating your error handling infrastructure is create your own kind of error that fits your need. So as you can see here, I created base error that actually extends the error class of JavaScript. And I give it a few properties. I give it a log and a method name because I like to send logs with their method name. So if I have a bug, I know exactly where to look for. HTTP code and the last and very important piece and probably the most important piece, piece is whether this error is an operational error or not. So this will help us later decide what to do with this error. And as you can see here in the implementation, we've extended the error object and this is how you do it. And we also capture the stack trace. So this way you can get the error with the full stack trace and everything. So this is our base error. We're gonna look in just a second on how we actually invocate that error and how we use it. So we have the base error. Then what you wanna do is you wanna create an error handler. So here's an error, error handler. This is how it looks like. And what we have here is pretty much the error handler has a logger and it has two methods. One is handle error, it accepts an error. And what it does is that it simply logs the error. So here you can do even more things. You can log the error, then send email, then send notification, then do X. So you can do many, many different things here because eventually everything will come down to this method. And then you have another method called is trusted error. And what this method does is pretty much it checks first whether this is an instance of the base error because if it's not an instance of the base error, then it probably it's not an operational error. You it hasn't been invoked intentfully. And then the second thing we check is that it's also an operational error. And we're gonna use this method later. Let's now go into the apps and see what we need to do in order to make this actually a central error handler. So up until now we created the base error, the error handler. Now what we have to do is actually register this as the middleware. So as you can see here, this is what we've done. And the error middleware is pretty simple. It checks whether it's an operational error. If it's not, then it's moving to the next, uh, the next middleware pretty much, or which is gonna be pretty much the uncut exception one we're gonna see later. And then if it's an operational error, all we're gonna do is simply log it. So here is where we make the distinction between go ahead and restart or go ahead and doesn't restart when it comes to our express middleware. But not everything is gonna be caught in express. Certain things are gonna be uncaught. So this is what we add this one here. So we listen to all the uncaught exceptions pretty much in Node.js. And then what we do is first handle the exception, go ahead and we log it. We do anything that's in the handle error logic. And then we check if it's a an operational error or not. And if it's not an operational error, we simply exit the process, which will lead to a restart in uh, in the Kubernetes cluster usually, or in the Dorky you're working with. So usually you have some sort of auto restart on a process exit. And uh, so you wanna implement that as well in order for it to actually work. So that's what you have in the apps. So now we've registered the global error handler. This is pretty much everything you need to do in order to register it. But I also wanna show you that you can create more type of errors like this. So here we have the base error, right? And the base error is, is one type of error, but we can also have another one like API error. And then in our app, we can make certain, di certain dis distinguishments between these two, just like I did. So I'm gonna show you that. So let's take a look at an example. We have our API here. This API has a certain route, does some validation, and then it installs something. So we click here and we see that it moves us to a controller. So the controller has an install something function, and then it calls the save in DB, which comes from a service. So let's take a look at the service and we're gonna go back and look at the controller in just a second. But essentially what we have here is a service. It has a function called save in DB. And first it checks if it's valid. So there's no actual code here. It's all kind of like pseudocode, but if it's not valid, it throws an API error. 
okay? On the other hand, we have a try and catch, and on the catch here, we throw a base error. Now, what's the difference here? Here's the difference. If you have a route and then you check for validity of something, you wanna actually go ahead and notify the client and maybe have that in your response and tell them, look, field X is not valid or this is what happened. But when you have a catch error, this can happen for many different reasons. You don't wanna send it to the send it to the client. So for this reason, for me, what I found that works the best is making, making the distinction between API errors and normal errors. And this way you can send all the API errors to the client and then you have different type of errors for yourself so you can log them and then view them later. So the reason why we wanted to make this distinction here is actually for the controller because now that we've thrown a specific error, we can go to the controller and see that in the catch clause, what we have here is that first we check if the error is an instance of the API error. If so, make the message the error message, and if not, then just have a generic error for the user. So this is how I like to use this. You can use this in many different ways. The principle is the same of catching the errors and doing something meaningful with them. And that's it for this video. I really hope you liked it and really hope you learned something new. And if you did and if you liked it, make sure you like, comment, share this, share this with, with your friends, and of course, subscribe to the channel to get more content just like this. Thank you so much for watching.